Welcome to today's Bible study. Today we're going to be going through the Gospel of John. If you haven't seen my intro to Bible study video, I highly, highly encourage you to go back and watch that video first because I've given you a lot of basics and core understandings of Bible study that I feel like would be that would be very beneficial for you uh, just to watch and, and understand before you jump into studying the Bible. So I have my Bible, my laptop, I have a notebook sitting over here as well as some handy dandy little highlighters. And so if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open them to the book of John and we will read together. But before I start reading, I want to pray for us because prayer is so important before you start reading scripture because it gives you a chance to ask God for understanding, to ask him for wisdom, to ask him for discernment, to ask him to help you interpret the really hard verses. So let's go ahead and pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you for giving us your word to read. I pray that you will help us to see in your word everything that you have intended for us to understand. I pray that you will help us to absorb this information, retain this information and recall it and help us to use it in our everyday lives. In Jesus name, amen. All right, so let's get started. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna read a couple of verses at a time and then we're gonna go back and we're gonna break them down. I'm gonna read some of the notes in my Bible and if there's something that comes up that I'm not sure of or would like a deeper meaning of the word, that's why I have my laptop so I can look up these words. And if you have any suggestions or a different way of studying the Bible, please leave it down in the comments because I would love to learn how you study the Bible as well. So I love how my Bible puts it. It says the theme of John's gospel is that Jesus is the promised Messiah and the Son of God. By believing in Jesus, people can have eternal life. So that is the entire theme of John, the purpose of the gospel of John. So the reason I say the gospel of John is because this is the fourth book in the New Testament, and it is the last of the four Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. So who wrote the book of John? So John was an apostle of Jesus, and he was the son of a man named Zebedee. The book of John, chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So let's go back to verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What does that mean? I know it's early, but i got to break out the highlighters. I know a lot of people think brown is bland, but I just think it's so cute. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Doesn't this sound familiar? I feel like we've heard this somewhere before. Well, if you look at the, the first couple words, in the beginning, where's the other place in the Bible that we see the words in the beginning? Back in Genesis, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, here it's saying, in the beginning was the Word. And so, what is the Word? What does that mean? It's with the capital W. If you haven't seen it or read it before, uh, I'll put the words up on the screen for you to see. But what is the word? So I'll give you a little spoiler. John in verse 14 is going to tell us that the word is Jesus. So if we reread this verse with that information in mind, it goes something like, In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God, and it continues on. So, so far, we have in the beginning was the Word, was Jesus. Jesus was existent at the beginning of the creation of the earth. And then second, we have the Word was with God. So, this type of grammar, the Word was with God, indicates a relationship, right? So, Jesus was with God at the time of creation. And then the Word was God, indicating Jesus' divine being as God himself. So this is a really good sort of introduction, if you will, into the Holy Trinity. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one, the one true God made of three persons. So in verse two, he. So look, if you look back where it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. The word he here, if you're just reading this without having any background knowledge, you're probably like, who the heck is he? Who, 
Who is this he that they're talking about when we haven't talked about anybody? Well, that's another confirmation that verse, is, uh, well, that verse 1 is talking about Jesus because it says he. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And we're still talking about the word here. We're still talking about Jesus. He, verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So when we're looking at verse 5 here, where it says the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Looking at verse 4, he was life, he was the, the light of men. All of these also kind of give you Genesis themes, if you will, because, you know, in Genesis we have light and then darkness enters the picture. I love how my Bible puts it. There's a note for verses four through five that say, against this background, Jesus is the light, brings to this dark world true knowledge, moral purity, and the light that shows the very presence of God. Okay, let's move into verse six. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his people did not receive him. But to, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor by the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. All right, let's break it down. Let's go back. So verse six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So don't get this confused with the person who wrote John, whose name is on the top, the, the gospel according to John. This is a different one. So when it says there was a man sent from God whose name was John, this guy is known as John the Baptist. It talks a little bit more about him in the previous Gospels. So just to tell you a little bit about John the Baptist, people today would probably think he's crazy. People back then probably thought he was crazy because he lived out in the wilderness and he ate locusts and honey and wore, I think it was camel skins. Um, but so obviously not a very wealthy man and he was out in the, the wilderness prophesying about Jesus, the one who was to come, the one who was to save, the one who was to restore. He was out there baptizing people in the Jordan River. So we're all caught up. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. So if we don't read this correctly, we can misinterpret the last part of that verse that all might believe through him. Because that, that's not talking about John anymore. That's talking about Jesus. So let's look at verse 7 as a whole. He came as a witness. We're still talking about John. John came as a witness to bear witness about the light, Jesus, that all might believe through him, Jesus. So we're still talking about how Jesus is the head of everything. How he's going to be the one to save. How he's going to be the one to restore that all might believe through Jesus. So verse eight, he was not the light, referring to John the Baptist again. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, Jesus. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. This is verse nine. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So look at that at the, end of the ver at the end of verse 11. His own people did not receive him. So what does receive mean? I'm looking at a little footnote in my Bible here, and it says receive him doesn't mean just agreeing mentally with some facts about Jesus, but also welcoming him, submitting to him in a personal relationship. Looking at the next verses, verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay, so verse 12, looking at the beginning of that, 
But all who did receive him and believed in him in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So for those who did believe in him, who did receive him, who did believe in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God who were born not of blood. So what does that mean? I've got a little note here again. Born not of blood, but of God. It makes clear that neither physical birth, nor ethnic descent, nor human effort can make people children of God. But only God's supernatural work. This extends the possibility of becoming God's children to the Gentiles and not just the Jews. So what's the difference between Gentiles and Jews? We know Jews follow Judaism and the principles of the um, the Jews in the Old Testament when God gave them the Ten Commandments and the rights of eating certain foods and certain festivals to celebrate, certain holidays to celebrate, certain rituals that they have to do. So that's Jews. And the Gentiles were everyone else. That's a little side note, but that's going to be important as we continue on through this Bible study. So verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So this is that little spoiler alert I was telling you about in verse 1 where it said the Word was with God, the Word was God. Um, so this is where it's saying that the Word is Jesus. So the Word became flesh. So Jesus became flesh, which he did. He was born to a virgin. He was born to Mary. And there was no earthly father. So the Holy Spirit, the Lord implanted a seed into Mary that was holy and pure, and then Jesus was born fully God and fully man. So in that sense, Jesus was still fully divine, fully God, but at the same time, he had flesh, he had blood, he had our the same emotions, he went through the same struggles. Everything that a normal man would go through, you know, physically, emotionally, growing-wise, Jesus went through all that too, all the while still being God. It's just like, psh, just like mind blown. I know, right? It's hard to grasp that, but it's true. So the word became flesh. Hallelujah. So verse 15, John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Well, he was. Jesus was existing forever. So he was before John. From, for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Amen. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So what is the law and who is Moses? So let's start with Moses. So Moses was an Israelite born in Egypt. And there was a law at the time that, or an edict that Pharaoh wanted to kill all of the newborn baby boys because the Israelites just kept multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. So Pharaoh wanted to put a stop to that. But Moses' mom was like, no, he's special. So she put him in a basket and like set him in the river. And anyways, long story short, he ended up in Pharaoh's castle because I believe it was Pharaoh's daughter that found him. And so he was raised as an Egyptian and he later was like, what am I doing? I would rather be back with my people suffering than living in sin and the pleasures of Egypt and the Pharaoh's house and all the things. So essentially, um, Moses led the people out of, out of Egypt, led the Israelites out of Egypt at a later time. Um, obviously with the Lord's hand guiding every step. And when he led the people out of Egypt, they eventually got to a place called Mount Sinai, and then Moses went up on the mountain, and God gave him the Ten Commandments to take back to the people of Israel for them to follow. And if you've read any part of the Old Testament, it will be very obvious to you that this was not something that they were able to keep. They were not able to follow these Ten Commands. So the law was given through Moses. It was something that the people couldn't live up to. They couldn't fulfill every single one of these commands because if you fail at one, you fail them all. And I love how this verse goes to say, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So it goes essentially talking about the law, which is essentially the law of sin and death. And then we have Jesus, grace and truth comes through Jesus. But he's the one who brings 
life, freedom, salvation. Because if you broke one of those commands back in the Old Testament, you had to um, to kill an animal and do a sacrifice uh, of the animal to take your place. So essentially it's like the sins are covered by the blood of this animal. And that's another thing about the Old Testament it is all a reflection of the New Testament because everything about the sacrificial, the sacrificial system back then was a reflection of what was to come and the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross for our sins. That was the ultimate penalty and nothing can ever take the place of Jesus on the cross. Like that is why Christians have hope. That is why we have hope of eternity in heaven with the Lord. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So looking at the last half of this verse, the only God who is at the Father's side, Jesus, Jesus has made the Father known. So Jesus, when he came to earth, he explained the Father to humanity. He explained who he was. Jesus frequently said, I want the will of my Father to be done, not my own will. And so don't let that confuse you in the sense that they're two different entities. They're the same God, but Jesus submits to the will of his Father, just as we are to submit to the will of the Father. Okay, so another example of Jesus submitting to the Father's will is found in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's betrayed by Judas. Um, he prayed this prayer. Okay, actually, this one is in Matthew. It's from Matthew 26 39 it says and going a little farther he fell on his face and prayed saying my father if it be possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not as i will but as you will so i feel like this topic can be a little hard to understand and hard to grasp how jesus is fully god but he's also fully man and if that's the case if him and the father are the same then why does it seem like he doesn't have his own say, or he has to submit to what the Father wants if they're the same person. You know what I mean? So I found an article that might kind of explain that a little bit better, because it, it is a hard thing to explain. So this says, Jesus had a perfect human nature as well as a divine nature. Yes, we've covered that. Fully man, fully God. The human nature was not divine. He took an inferior position as a human being, but he was not inferior in nature. And Christ humbled himself by taking on the form of a human being. John 14, 28 says, You heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So when we hear that statement, the Father is greater than I, he did not mean that he was less than God or an inferior God. So when we read that verse and it says, for the Father is greater than I, there's an article that really explains that really well. It says, Jesus is speaking of his human nature. We must constantly remind ourselves that the human nature Jesus united to his divine nature is the nature of a creature like us. It's the human nature which made it possible for Jesus, who is God, to be born to grow, to hunger, to suffer, and to die, things that divine nature cannot do. It's this human nature that enables Jesus to say the Father is greater than I, and it becomes clear in this context. So through this mystery, his human nature will be glorified, and the way will be made clear for our human nature to share in that glory. And so Jesus says, if you loved me, you would be happy to know that I'm going to the Father because that will be the glory of my humanity and yours. So I feel like that kind of helps explain that a little bit more. If anybody has any more information, please leave it down in the comments, because like I said, I know that this can be a really hard thing to explain. But as we see in the first part of reading through John, Jesus has already been identified as the Word. He is the only God. He, is, he has been in existence from the beginning. He's seated at the right hand of God. Or it says here that, let me find it, but here in verse 18 it says that he's at the Father's side. So please don't let that confuse you to the point where you're questioning Jesus' divinity because he's still fully God, he is still alive today, and I'm very excited to continue reading through the rest of John with you.
And if you'd like to be notified about when these Bible studies come out, when I post them onto YouTube, make sure to subscribe. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and a comment. I would love to just have conversations with you all in the comments about the Gospel of John, things that you have learned, because I'm definitely not an expert. I'm not a know-all about this, but I would just love to have a conversation with you. So I will see you guys next time.